Welcome to this presentation on the end of the flood. Presentation on the end of the flood and scientific disagreement in creation science. There are certain topics that is generally best to avoid. Obviously, politics, predestination versus free will, music styles can be hot potato, global warming, climate change, uh, your favorite politicians, and if you're a creation scientist, the end of the flood definitely joins that list. But I will tackle it anyway. First, my qualifications for making such an audacious presentation. I'm a software developer. I took an online class in physical geology. I regularly lead, read the creationist literature. I own a number of geology books, and I've even read two of those books. Obviously, uh, qualification is not there. But the point is, there's a number of very highly qualified, morally upstanding people with different opinions on this topic. The end of the flood is not something that qualifications can resolve. It's a different type of problem. How in the world do you have a situation where you have good people with different opinions? Obviously, there's some bad ideas here. Disagreement between experts is an example of a class of problem that I'll call kind of loosely discrepancies between reality and what people think. Why would smart and talented people hold on to obviously flawed positions? Because that's what you're saying. If there's reality and what people are thinking are different, people are holding on to things that are flawed. It's a really interesting question. And, and one that I really believe is a lot more to do with psychology and sociology than it does with the actual topic at hand. Searching for the root of these kind of disagreements can lead you in unexpected directions because, again, it's a, it's a pursuit in psychology and sociology rather than a pursuit in pure science. Although definitely the science plays a role. So first, I want to uh, make some apologies. I find just these type of situations where you have brilliant people taking different sides really fascinating. And most people do not find that fascinating. Most people would rather not face those kind of controversies. It makes people awkward, feel awkward and uncomfortable. And I risk, by my interest in this subject, being insensitive to the feelings of, of people involved. And I want to make it very clear, I have the highest respect for everyone who has an opinion on the end of the flood. And many of these people I consider my heroes, on both sides, by the way. So I do not mean to, um, to, to be insensitive to anybody and their positions on this subject. I found from observation that what happens with disagreements is that you end up with, of course, falsehood and truth that is sort of scattered about the problem domain. And initially, it's not really clear what's going on. Just bits of data are starting to be, to be assembled, and, and people are trying to figure out a, a, a model for what's going on. And naturally, you want to gather all the falsehood over on one side and all the truth over on the other side and draw a line right between the two, and that's, you know, we, we made it. We figured this thing out. But that's not what happens an unfortunate amount of the time. Instead, the line gets drawn whoop, down the middle. So you've got some truth on one side, some truth on the other side, some falsehood on one side, and falsehood on the other side. And eventually, as time goes on, those positions tend to ossify with a group of people on one side and a group of people on the other side. And they, they tend to, to just yell at each other. So you must understand that when it started, it was not clear what was truth and what was falsehood. You had some Ruth running around here and some also over there and some hood and some rut. And you're trying to, to, these parts and pieces of the data, you're trying to figure out 
does rut mean truth, or is that something false? You're trying to piece all these things together, and it's, it's very, very difficult. And so the lines get drawn when there is not much clarity. So you can't blame the early people for drawing a line, a conclusion, when the information was, was sketchy. But of course, as time goes on, things become more clear. But the tendency is that one side views the truth on their side and the falsehood on the other side. And of course, the opposite is true. The other side is looking at their truth and pointing at the other side's falsehood. And so it feels like a complete argument. I can argue for my truth and I can prove you wrong. Except that both sides can do that. And of course, both sides don't listen to each other very well because they feel like they have a complete argument, even though they don't. So, now I must say that a more realistic model is the line is not evenly through the truth and the falsehood. It will just, by nature, be somewhat random. So one side may have more truth than the other side, and they may have more falsehood than the other side, but that doesn't mean that both sides can, can look at their own truth and blame the other guy's falsehood. And of course, the, the lines tend to be drawn rather, so each side will claim more truth on their side than really exists. They'll, they'll claim some of the other side's territory. And, and they'll also blame the other side for falsehoods that don't really belong on the other side. So it gets really muddy and really messy. One of the reasons, though, that people tend to be caught up in this is that their own knowledge, their expertise, tends to be somewhat limited. So I'm an expert in this little circle of truth over here. Well, of course I'm going to be on this side. It makes all the sense in the world. So let's look at some solutions to this problem. Um, okay, so let's step away from previous assumptions, reevaluate the question in the context of the modern information. <sighs> yeah. Step away from all of your tradition. Now, you've gone to school, you've learned from teachers, people that you respected deeply. You've worked in the field next to people. You've, you know, sat there under the sun eating sandwiches caked in, you know, Cretaceous dirt that's blown up from your dig and, and had conversations. I mean, th these connections, people connections, are really, really powerful. And we pick up, you know, what Dr. So-and-so told us becomes embedded in our soul as part of our DNA. It's very hard for us to step away and say, he was wrong. She was wrong. That, that, that's, that's a difficult thing. In fact, in secular science, it's a kind of a well-known thing that ideas change really slowly. And you can't just convince a bunch of people to change their ideas. They need to retire. And then a new generation of experts come with different opinions. And then those opinions don't change until that generation retires, dies off. So it's, it's, a, uh, it's a very difficult thing to, to move away from an entrenched position. So, let's try anyway. Let's use the end of the flood as our, our, our test case. Let's look at our diagram again. We've got truth and falsehood, right? So we're going to try to eliminate our preconceptions. So let's, let's, let's think about it. All right, so probably the first thing we should do is think broadly, because we're, we're stepping away, we're going to think broadly about this topic. Uh, uh, no, don't do that. That's not going to work. Now, why would that not work? <laughs> Thinking broadly about the topic is how you solve these things. No, no, you don't. Because... Again, these topics are very, very, very broad. My expertise is a little piece. So when I think broadly, I just, I'm going to think around my area of expertise. And I'm more likely to just entrench myself in my own position 
because I'm simply thinking more broadly about how I already view the world. I'm not changing my worldview. I'm just thinking more broadly within my worldview. That's really the natural tendency. And so you're still going to end up in, in the same fallacy. Um, here's a couple of great examples of thinking broadly taking you down a road that goes nowhere. A bunch of really good reasons to be a Republican. Yeah, there's also a bunch of really good reasons to be a Democrat. Reasons to vote for the Democrats. I could write a book that says reasons to vote for Republicans. I mean, these two authors could switch their titles and it would be the same. A comprehensive guide? Sure. It's a comprehensive five to one worldview. That's not going to resolve your problem. So, if we can't think broadly to resolve our problem, what are we going to do? I think what you've got to do is reframe the disagreement. You need to attack your own position, which is not a very comfortable thing to do by any means. Is there any one piece of data that you can find that invalidates your position? Because what you're trying to do is not gather a bunch of data around your position. You're trying to attack that line that you've drawn between these positions and destroy that line. If you can get rid of that line, then you can draw that line in a different fashion. Of course, attack the opposing position. Is there something that, invalid again, validate the line between your, your, your position? Is there any data that invalidates that position? Is there any new line you can draw that will survive the attacks that you place on one and the other? If I can invalidate both of these positions, but yet make a new description of what's going on that I cannot invalidate, then maybe that's the new line I need to draw. You want small, simple arguments. We're, again, not trying to amass, you know, large chunks of data to, to come up with this thing. That, that again, tends to, to get you entrenched. It would, it's, it's the line between them that we want to deal with. So, I'm going to give it kind of a half-hearted, this is not, not deep by any means, attempt to, to, to do that with the end of the flood. So, We've got to hear the, 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 the passage, right? And a dove came into him the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off, so Noah knew the waters were abated from off the earth. And he stayed yet another seven days, and sent forth the dove, which returned not again to him any more. It came to pass on the six hundredth and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up off the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark, and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the seventh and twentieth day of the month, the earth was dried. And Noah spake, God spake to Noah, saying, Go forth out of the ark, you, your wife, your sons, and your sons' wives with you. So what do we see? Well, there's a couple things happening to the earth in these verses that are, that are, that are fascinating. You've got a drying of the earth, the water is abating from the earth and drying and so forth taking place. It's a geological type activity. But you also have the olive leaf. And you have also the bird just flying off and leaving. Obviously, it, it found that, hey, I can sustain my life out here. I don't need to come back for food. So you've got a biological activity taking place. So I think we should think of the end of the flood as a biological event, just as much as it's a geological one. And, and by saying that, what I'm hoping to do is that line where it's like, okay, where in the geological column do we put the barrier between the end of the flood and the... Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. The end of the flood is biological and geological. It's both. So you can't draw a line the geological column because that's a half argument. Because it's biological and geological. So let's, let's, let's try to erase that way of thinking, and let's try to draw our line in a way that goes biologically and geologically. So 
perhaps that'll give us a different view, perspective to attack the topic. So let's look at a real example to maybe see how this, this different view plays out. So it's a mystery rock layer. I know because I, what it is, because I took the picture. And we'll act as if the uh, geography, you know, the location, the geology, we, we don't know anything about it. So what we see here is you can see some grass growing and this, I mean, we're not talking about a thick rock layer that specifically we're looking at, of course, it's part of a larger unit. Um, this is like you know, maybe a meter tall, right? And so I, I took this picture here of, of what's going on. So we've got right here on this side, some, some debris that is eroded down and it's, it's covering this area. It's a, a harder material that you can kind of clearly speculate that it was from a higher layer, it eroded underneath it, and you know the pieces came eroding down. And a post-flood erosion. You know, that's pretty clear that that's what's going on here. Um, we also have some, some homogenation of soil from plant growth up here along the, the, the top area and down here, right, where you have the various grasses growing and they're their roots are disturbing the soil and, and homogenizing it. And it's a really great example up here of this, this just homogenized soil. Um, so both of those are clearly post-flood activities, right? Um, so from this, we can draw some conclusion that layers of extensive bioturbation mark the flood post-flood boundary. Right, because it's a biological event. When the flood ended, the grasses grew and disturbed the soil. And so anything that's disturbed is post-flood, and anything that's not disturbed has the potential of being flood material. I'm not saying it is, but there's the potential. Right? Because there's always the possibility erosion could have destroyed a boundary, right? Okay. So, we can't just say that the bioturbation boundary is the flood post flood boundary, because you could have erosion that may have destroyed the original boundary. Some post flood um, catastrophic events could create a, a new boundary, lower boundary. Um, but if the bioturbation boundary has changed due to a post-flood event, then a source for that erosion should be present. So if we look here, there's not much bioturbation here for a um, you know post-flood timeline. So what exactly is going on? Well, what happens is that this is actually in a gully with a relatively heavy erosion taking place. So that's why we don't see a lot of post-flood erosion. I'm sorry, not sorry. <laughs> that's why we don't see a lot of post-flood um, bioturbation. And we see some of this debris from, from post-flood erosions that took place. So we're skirting with a, an issue here. Um, what about this? We see here little layer, little bits of actually coal that are scattered through here. Um, we see some um, cross bedding going on here on the right hand side. So uh, very much some, some water activity took place and deposited this, this layer below the bioturbation. So, what is happening here? Is this a, a for the cross bedding, is it a, a deposited water deposit or a windblown deposit? Uh, my worldview tends to immediately discount that this was a, a wind view, wind uh, deposit, but it could be. It could be a post-flood wind deposit that has plant growth on top of it. Um, 
So, hard to say. Um, but layers above and below show clear evidence of water deposits. So that would indicate that because there's no bioturbation disturbing the layers above and below, immediately above and below the, the cross bedding, it would suggest the cross bedding is also water deposited and that all those layers took place simultaneously. So I think it's reasonable to say this, this whole chunk of a, of a meter thick of mudstone is a catastrophically deposited layer. So, if it's post-flood, we should find a bioturbation or erosional discontinuity somewhere below this, right? So you had a, a post-flood surface, and then some post-flood catastrophe came along and, and scraped things out or deposited this material on top. Right? And if it's a flood activity, you could see discontinuities as well. So it, it's not super clear if you do see discontinuities below, if it's flood or post-flood, which kind of muddies the issue. And unfortunately, I don't know. So even though we're, we're, we're trying to use our new method of biology and geology to understand what's going on here, or a little bit of an impasse. However, I know some interesting things that may have a factor. Um, the layer covers the part, this layer, I should say, the, um, the, the formation this layer's in covers the parts of more than one state. However, unfortunately, small formations are of no real diagnostic value because you could have post-flood activities that could cover parts of more than one state. So, again, we're kind of stuck. Um, but let's think a little bit about these small post-flood deposits. They would, if disruptions during the flood, you know, volcanoes, mountain formation, etc., would create some of these small deposits. And end of the flood runoff could create small deposits, right? If, if we're looking at continent-wide type activities, that's clearly flood activities and, you know, problem solved. But if we're looking at smaller deposits, it could be just some sort of disruption within the flood that, that made these, these deposits. Or end of the flood runoff, mountains are forming perhaps during the end of the flood runoff, and you have some small deposits forming during the flood. So that, that could be a way to create small deposits. Um, you can get, of course, small deposits, obviously, from post-flood activity, from some event activity taking place. I don't think we're stuck, though. Because catastrophic deposits have a cause. There's a causal effect on every catastrophic deposit. The cause for the flood, of course, is water was brought over the land. So as it was brought over the land, it created all sorts of activities and, and um, created all sorts of deposits from the, the, the event of the water crossing the land. So, you, with flood activity, you tend not to find, if you will, the cause of the catastrophic deposits. It, it was part of this, this global event. This pulse of water came rushing over, multiple pulses came rushing over the continents. So, the cause is not like, hey, it came from that reservoir. However, post-flood um, catastrophes would come from some sort of source. Uh, if they're, they're a reservoir, if it's a water type catastrophe, of course, if it's a wind blown type thing, then well, that's different. Kind of hard to track a source for that. But we've already identified that this particular deposit is a water deposit. So if there's a post flood cause, it had to come from a reservoir. So, 
we should be able to find the source if it's post-flood, because not a lot of overlapping activities took place post-flood to erase the, the signs of the, of the source. And then it's true, Lake Missoula, the, um, oh, this picture here, I don't know if it's that great, I've seen some better ones, but you've got signs of the, the lake shore of glacial Lake Missoula that eventually catastrophically an ice dam failed and you've got this, you know, massive amounts of erosion and deposition taking place down the Columbia River Valley. But you can track right back to where it came from. You've got a source that's identifiable. So that's a very important clue in trying to identify if a small deposit, I should probably use that in quotes because that can be very large, um, is post-flood or a flood deposit. If it's post-flood, we should either find the reservoir or have a really good reason why the reservoir, the, the signs of the reservoir would have been erased in the post-flood era. So, in this case, is there a source for a post-flood catastrophe? And short answer, no. There are mountains in the general area where this picture is taken. But the mountains have been studied in great detail, and there's no signs of large reservoirs in those mountains. Not sufficient to create a multi-state deposit of the size that the formation that this particular layer is in. So it looks quite strongly if there's no source for a, an activity that would have deposited this material, then our boundary is probably right here, where we've got the plant growth that's disturbing the soil, and then um, undisturbed uh, deposits. So, now there is, of course, a weakness to this argument, right? We're arguing from an absence of evidence. We're saying there is no source for a post-flood event that would have laid these layers down. I think we're okay because this is again an area that's been studied in great detail. But again, it's, it's not a really strong argument. Evidence as evidence is, is never anyone's favorite argument. But this formation, I kind of left this out, but there's places where it's like 1,900 feet worth of layers covering multiple states. That's a lot of material. A reservoir for that would, uh, if it lasted for very long, would create significant shorelines. And those would not be in the, you know, 4,500 years since the flood. Those would not go away easily. So I, I think we're fairly safe saying, yep, this, this deposit is a flood deposit based on the combination of understanding the bioturbation and understanding the, the geology of, of what happened here. So, as noted before, the size formation is not proof of a flood origin, but a reservoir large enough to catastrophically deposit a formation that big, right, it's going to leave significant geological evidence. So you've got to go, if you're going to prove post-flood, you need to identify a place for the energy to come from to create those deposits. So, to recap here, biological evidence, lack of disturbance, indicates a catastrophic origin. Lack of post-flood water source, large enough to supply the necessary energy to create this deposit, indicates a flood origin. So, what is it? Lance Formation, Wyoming. It's in the Cretaceous area of the geological column. Um, I chose something that would be completely non-controversial because nobody considers this to be anything but a flood deposit. But I wanted to use this as an example to, to walk through how we could use logic, a combination of biological and geological logic, to track down what makes sense in a particular deposit. Uh, 
So to conclude here, uh, that I believe the evidence suggests that the flood post-flood boundary isn't a line on the geological column. Rather, it's a biological and or geological boundary between flood and post-flood activity. But biologically, the post-flood activity is marked by high levels of bioturbation. Geologically, post-flood activity is marked by identifiable sources of energy for deposition and erosion. So combining those two, I think, gives us our best shot at understanding where that boundary is. And I'm certainly not the last person or the first person to make the suggestion that the geological column is probably not where we should draw our line. It, it needs to be something where we look more localized at specific deposits and looking at the biological and geological data to make a conclusion about that specific formation within that particular environment. That similar looking deposits may in fact have very different um, sources and different timing. So here's your opportunity, throw a few rocks. Um, if I was doing this live, we'd ask questions. Um, so I'm going to throw out a few little conundrums, right? If drainage from the end of a flood is pooled in a lake and then bursts out, is that flood or post-flood? How long does that lake have to be there before it's considered a post-flood deposit? Uh, again, it's, it's kind of semantic. It, it's a really, it's a word conundrum. Um, how, what do you define the end of the flood? So here's a, a couple of uh, resources that I, I would recommend. Um, to be honest, I've only skimmed. I've not, not read both of these. Um, but they, uh, they seem to be excellent overviews of both sides. The, the, the first side takes a, a, a lower flood boundary, and the second um, takes a higher flood boundary. Um, and I think that there's material in both that could be, could be useful in understanding this topic. So thanks for joining me.